Good morning. If you could turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to be reading. Uh, that will be a central passage for today. And as you're turning there, um, I want to play this uh, video as you make your way to the passage. Well, hello, this is Ken Gott again, because last time I was with you was at the Holy Spirit Firefall Conference. This conference is about breakout, breaking out with the fire of God into community, into society. You know, I believe transformation is simply this, sustained revival. If we can have a revival that is sustainable, then we will have transformation. I believe this time when I come to Hawaii that God is just going to ignite something. I'm, I'm so excited and uh, more than excited, actually in faith, believing that as much as we received last time, that God has much, much more for us this time. All of that is possible out of this conference. We're going to have a Holy Ghost explosion, I believe, like we have never seen before. Amen. sure you save the date, put that on your calendar, uh, because everything we've been doing really relates to what, to this gathering and having God move and work in it through our lives and our families and in the marketplace. More and more are learning that, um, that God is transforming our mindset about what church is. We've been grown up and we've been accustomed and we've been discipled to operate as church based from man's traditions, man's ways, and man's thinking. And it is so far from God's intention, from God's design. And so having these gatherings really is bringing greater awareness for all of us, beginning with us as pastors, that the true church is actually the, the kingdom of God. And so it's about how do we live in the kingdom of God? What is our role in the kingdom of God? And the role and function we have in the kingdom of God on earth is family. And this is what we're talking about. This is in line with the prophetic word, what God has been saying to us for the past couple of weeks, that he's bringing the prodigals home. And we have to right now with Thanksgiving coming this week and by faith seeing, having an expectation of God doing something significant in our families, in your family, in the family of God where prodigals will feel an urge, a sense, a longing to wanting to go back home, reconciling relationships between uh, them and the family. So we have to get ourselves ready. And one of the challenges that we've been having, I think, for many of us is this issue of grace. Does that mean that we just uh, all of a sudden just neglect or turn ourselves away from discipline, from correction, uh, don't we identify the issues and the sins that they have committed? Oh, absolutely. Just because we're going to operate in grace doesn't mean we just, uh, just one fell swoop deny the offense and the problems that the product have made. But at the same time, be fully aware that perhaps we had a role in why they became prodigals. And so it's taking our position as leaders of the family, leaders of God's family, Leaders of the family being the husband and the wife, the father and the mother coming together says, what kind of role did we play? What kind of decisions did we make? What kind of actions and behavior did we have that actually had a role in producing a prodigal? Because oftentimes we think it's all their fault. No, they had a role, absolutely. But we as parents understand that, hey, you know what, we had a role too. And it's owning up to that. It's taking responsibility of that. And admitting that and confessing that and simply saying, yes, Lord, I blew it. Help me. I've learned that prodigals produce prodigals. So we, too, have to get rid of our orphan spirit and mindset and pattern as parents and as leaders. And all of this is... is directly related from today's word, God's instrument for reaching the world, is really through family. God's vehicle, God's passion and desire for all to be saved 
his master plan in getting people and family into the kingdom of God is not by organization. It's not by having organized church the way you and I have been accustomed to that we were born and raised up to. Or you got to send your sinners, your, your sinner friends, people who, who are lost, unsaved, who need Jesus Christ. Oftentimes in the past, we'd be trained to bring them to church. No, that's, that's one small way. The primary way is that you, the church, is that you lead your family, you lead your friends, and you lead the unsaved in your sphere of influence into the kingdom of God. And what is your role, Pastor Ellie? Is to equip you and train you. That's my role, according to Ephesians chapter 4. It's to equip, to coach, to mentor, to train, to, dis to disciple, discipline the church to do the work of God. That's my work. Your work is to do the work. Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen. <laughs> if we both say amen, we all win. And so does the world. You know, when God sent his son, he never sent his son for the church. He sent his son for the world. So we have to have a different level of affinity and love for the world. That oftentimes we have put a, well, sometimes we, very subtly, we've put a sign above our churches and above the doors of our homes and said, Sinners not welcomed. Prodigals not welcomed. Uh, but if you look at scripture and the gospels, this is all the kind of people Jesus hung, on with, hung out with. And so as we prepare our homes, move the furniture and change the carpet to make our homes and our churches feel more accommodating, with hospitality in the name of the Lord. The word hospitable in the Bible actually means a friend of strangers. If you have a gift of hospitality, the idea in the picture is this. If a stranger enters into your home, they feel like they're at home. They feel like they're in their own home when they grew up. They feel safe, they feel welcome, they feel cared for, and they feel loved. That's hospitality in the name of the Lord. Is allowing people to drop their guards. And that's the ultimate goal that God has for us, but we have to establish a context of grace, of mercy. And by doing that, in no way does it mean that we don't talk about discipline or, or we skip through correction. And even justice, which is a nice word of saying punishment. All these things included in grace. And this is what we're going to talk about today. God's vehicle for reaching the world is the family. Look at, from beginning to end, we're just going to use a, a real brief journey from uh, Genesis to Revelation. It began with Adam and Eve. In Genesis 1.28, Genesis chapter 2, he forms the family. And this is the inception and his plan for ruling the earth, heaven on earth. He started with a family. Part of my job, and it's a, it's a wonderful privilege to be able to officiate weddings, and I talk and I do premarital counseling with the husband and wife, soon to be husband and wife, and they said, oh, we cannot wait to become a family. I said, what do you mean by that? I said, oh, when we get kids. I said, oh, let me provide some counsel. The day you guys say I do, you guys are automatically family. Don't wait till you think that, oh, I've got to have kids and then I become a family. No, you are a family as soon as you make covenant with husband and wife in the name of the Lord. You are family. And that's a blessed union. And it's the union, it's the vehicle, it's the instrument that God said, I'm going to use this to save the world. So for those of you who are married, your marriage is a house of God. 
Your marriage is an instrument in God's hand to bring the loss into the kingdom of God. Refrain or temper. You should come to my church. You should hear Pastor Ellie. You should hear the worship team. You should meet the brothers and sisters. All these things are necessary. Absolutely. Don't get me wrong. I encourage you to say those things. But the first thing I want to say is use your marriage as an instrument to represent, to radiate the goodness of God. Uh, what if you're not married? Single parent. Use your family. Use your house. Let your house be the true church. It's actually, according to these verses, the first church. Adam and Eve, then they actually went to Abraham and Sarah. And these promises of God is that he would use Abraham and Sarah's family. God would bless their family. No family more blessed than Abraham and Sarah. We must un understand this. God's measurement of success and blessing is not how much you have. It's how much you give. And it's not about I give more than you. Is are you faithful with what God telling you to give? That's the standard you measure your giving to. Not so and so gave this much, so and so gave that much, and I only gave this much, so uh, I'm not a good giver. No, that's the wrong thinking. You're not a good giver if you're not faithful and obedient to what God telling you to give. And money is just one small role of that. The reason why Abraham and Sarah so give because so so generous because God gave them a blessing and they became a blessing to the nations. Anybody who belongs to Jesus Christ falls under the family and the lineage of Abraham and Sarah. Because they said, I will obey Father God. In Genesis twenty two, verse seventeen and eighteen. Your descendants and all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. So if the marriages and families in this church, in this ecclesia, can sincerely say in your heart, Lord, use me and my family, no matter where we are right now. We might be bust out. We might be broken. Right now, we might be wretched. My, right now, our house look more like hell. But Lord, change our house. Change our family. Change me. Change everything in our house and use our house to be an instrument for your purposes. Watch God answer your prayers. Watch God transform, overhaul, renew, break down your family, build your family up, and use you and your family to be a blessing to your extended family and beyond. I love our church, but I want to hear once a week with you folks. The church next door, my family, I'm with them every week, every day. And we're working really hard to make sure that that is ecclesia as well. So it's, it's our families, Abraham and Sarah. This is God's goal for you and your family. Incredibles. God has gifted each and every one of you tremendous supernatural power. If you and I are not worrying the gifting, the anointing, the plans, the calling that God has given us, it's custom made. If we're not wearing that, you know what we're wearing? Hobo suits. And hobo suit is a suit that has to do with our orphan tendencies and patterns. We're living in the past. Specifically living in our past. Failures, mistakes, defeats, and we and we, we allowing our past mistakes govern us, shape us in our thoughts, actions, and our relationship with God. When actually God's saying, I want to actually use you and your family to save the world. I want to use you and your family to change the community. I want to use you and your family to be a blessing to your own family. And you say, well, Trust me, you got, you got supernatural powers. It's in there. It's in there. 
even in captivity. God sends Israel, his people, into 70 years of captivity. God is so good. Even when you're in prison, he's encouraging you. <laughs> even when you rebel, he still has hope in you. Even though you have complete unfaithfulness to him, he is still faithful to you. And this is what Jeremiah is saying. A prophet, a mouthpiece for God, speaking to God's people who are in captivity. He's saying, hey, even though you guys are in prison, this is what God said to all of us, okay? So you were in prison, but don't be a prisoner. We're going to be in prison. We're going to be in lockdown. But God continues to want us to worship him and to live life as is in a different, in a different place. So build your homes, plant your gardens, bless your city, but most of all, pray. So they stripped away. God broke down the temple because they desecrated with idols. So God did a transfer. Nothing can stop God, y'all. Nothing. So what replaced the temple? The home. The temple was a place for people to go and connect and to worship and praise the Lord. Uh, Jeremiah, we don't want a temple to, for us to go and gather together to worship the Lord. Yeah, it could look different though when we praise and worship. Instead of us doing corporately together as a nation at the temple, here's what we got to do. We're going to have to praise and worship the Lord as a family in our own homes. Same God, same worship, different venue. Well, how about the priest? The priest was the one who took care of all the ceremonial cleansing rituals to prepare us. And, you know, they mediate. They, they come between us and God. So what's, how are we going to do that? Uh, fathers and mothers, you guys are the priests. You guys are the teacher of God's word. Moms and dads, you guys take full responsibility in discipling your kids. Because right now we're no more in temple. Well, how about the altar where we put our sacrifice? And part of where we, we, that's part of our bread too. It comes from our bread. Uh, your dinner table. Your dinner table is going to be a place where you come together as a family. You break bread. Remember what God has done for us when we were slaves in Egypt. Okay. One, two, three, ready to break. You can go home and wash them. It's all stuff. It's going back to the family church. It's always been about family. In Acts, the gospel spreads from house to house. In chapter 5, it says, and every day in the temple. So they were going to the temple. And if you study the Apostle Paul's life, the more he went to the temple, his love for the temple, his love for his people, the more and more persecution he received because they were closing the door to the gospel. So it began to spread into the Gentile nations outside of Israel, outside of Jerusalem. And the place it grew the most was in the oikos, was in the house. It's relationships that matters. Not performances. It's relationship. We can impress people with performances, but to impact people for the kingdom of God, it's about relationships. The impression that we can make on our friends and our loved ones, people we're reaching for because God has impressed his presence upon us. And it closes with revelations. Jesus and his bride. That's us. We are his bride. So from beginning to end and everything in between, the theme of family is ingrained through every book of the Bible. How, what, what was the first thing Jesus said? It's not, so I want participation. When the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray, what's the first thing Jesus said in that prayer? Our Father. He never said Yahweh. 
He never say, when you talk to God, say Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rafi, Jehovah Nisi. All, there's about 60, 60, 60 plus names that God has. And the disciples whom Jesus is training saying, hey, can you teach us how to pray? The first thing Jesus says when you, you want to learn to pray. Okay, when you talk to God, address him as dad. Address him as daddy. So family is ingrained into our faith. It is our faith. This is the foundation on how we set our homes right for allowing and making prodigals feel welcomed. In your own heart and mind right now, would you say your house is family friendly? If people were to enter into your home, if cameras were able to watch you and your family, would the world be able to say, that's a blessed family, that's a welcoming family, that's a loved family, that's a, that's a family that I wish I had? If it's not family, then what is it? Prison? A torture chamber? A octagon? And be real. If, if you don't know, ask your kids. Your kids are going to tell you. And in, in those kinds of questions, what your kids say matters more than what you say your family is. I can say anything I like about our church. But if anybody interview our church, I'm going to say, you talk to the people because they're going to actually tell you the truth. I may have one way of perceiving how the church should be, but you guys can get the, the better picture, the more real picture. And the same with the family. God wants to change your family. God wants to change our family. And right now you might think it's impossible, Ellie, because I messed it up big time. Be true. But I think I heard Paul say, wherever sin abounds, grace abounds even more. I think it's in the Bible. I think it's in Romans. I know it's in Romans. You messing up is real. Grace being, grace being greater than sin is real as well. But here's a challenge. Which of the two are you going to actually live by? Which of the two are you going to actually believe? And then which of the two are you going to actually submit to? Because if you can submit and allow that you messed up to be the governing agent of your life, you'll never change your house. Nor will God because you're simply saying, I don't want God to do it. It's the bottom line. But if you have faith in the Lord and a desire to have God change your house and your family and your marriage, trust me, God wants to do it. And he can. See, when the house is right, when it's set right, when it's founded and established right in the context of grace, in the context of mercy and kindness, you can actually use, we can use discipline, correction, and justice that promotes health, <laughs> that promotes life, and that promotes growth. Because that's the actual intention of discipline and correction. Primarily those two, and even justice. But the sole purpose of, of these three is to actually produce growth, life, good fruit, and blessings. Is it easy? No. But if it's in the right context, the seed will grow. You will see the seeds that God is sowing in you and your family produce fruit while you are alive. Can I get, a, can I get an amen? 
I don't want to sow and then I die and all of a sudden I see all the fruit from above. Gracious discipline. God is calling you to break the sasa stick. What, I, what I'm talking about the sasa stick is about any instrument, whether it's an actual physical instrument that you use to discipline your kids, break it. God wants to break it in you. It's a stronghold. Maybe it's when our kids, and, and everything I say is not just for family. I'm talking about in all aspects of your life, especially when you're in a position of authority. So this applies to work, this applies in a marketplace, and obviously this applies in the church. But we're going to use family and, and, and that ecclesia just kind of as the basis. If it's not an actual physical instrument, a tangible one, but maybe it's when our kids do something to offend us or hurt us and we use a very harsh word or a harsh tone. Or maybe we allow ourselves to give in to a spirit of, um, of anger that controls us and leads us to sin. Maybe it's rage. Maybe it's ungodly fear. Whatever the case may be, and you want it out of you. I'm saying God wants it out of you as well. And the question really is for you. is: uh, Are you willing to, to partner with God and have him break this in you? Because if, if you really want this out of you and your family, um, you're going to have to hate it too. If you use it to discipline your kids and you sick of yourself using it because of the pain you see in your kids and the pain that's upon you and your family, the destruction you've seen, then you're, you're ready. You're ready. If you don't see it as a problem, I might catch up with you later on, hopefully. All kidding aside, if, if we don't see that as a problem, you may not have your family with you. You may actually lose your family. That's the reality. So what we're talking about here is not for the faint at heart. These are some things that we have inherited from people that we adore, from people that we honor, And God is saying, that's rubbish. The people you received it from is not rubbish, but what you have received is not from me. You got to believe God with this. God always has something better for you. So what you... what. Oftentimes, especially when we receive it from our parents and from our culture and from, from generations that come before us, oftentimes might be a good intent, but they don't fit in the kingdom. They're, they're not allowed in the kingdom of God. And so we have a huge internal conflict where we want to get rid of it because we, we, we acknowledging it's bring a lot of pain but we feel like if we get rid of it, we're going to actually dishonor our family, we're going to dishonor our parents, we're going to dishonor our culture. That's a lie straight from hell. Don't believe that lie. God loves you. God loves your parents more than he loves you. In fact, he honors your parents more than you honor your parents. And he loves your, our culture. But the, there's aspects of every single culture that has demonic influences and that all of these things has to be broken off. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7, it says, As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. 
Who ever heard of a child who is never dis who is never disciplined by its father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? So what God is, what, what the author is saying in Hebrews chapter 12, and even before that, he is basically saying, we got this race to run. And in order for us to be efficient in this race and to run successfully at a, at a tempo that God sets, at a pace that God says, we got to strip ourselves from anything that's going to slow us down. And anything that's going to hinder us has to be removed. If we want to run and run well. So in order that for, for that to happen, discipline is going to be needed. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hands, how many of you want to actually win state titles? How many of you want to actually win national titles? If you truly want to be a winner in life, you need discipline. I don't care how talented you may be. I don't care how gifted you may be. I don't care how anointed you may be. If you don't have discipline, you're not successful. That's what the Bible is saying. So the first part of Hebrews says, hey, cut off some excess weight. You don't need you, that stuff you carry. <laughs> You're going to lose the race if you hold on to that. We're going to disqualify ourselves. In verse 10, for our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline was good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So here's... Verse 12 is so part, 12 and 13. So take a, take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees, making out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. That's a coach saying, suck it up, let's go. That's Coach Paul. Coach Paul is a winner. <laughs> coach Paul knows how to win. You ever been around conversations between losing teams and winning teams? You should hear the different kind of talk and language and communication that takes place in a team that constantly lose and a team that constantly win and how they react to winning and losing. That's a whole different kind of conversation. Oftentimes, in, 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 the, in, the, in a winning culture, you get your toes stepped on. Why? Because you get challenged. Because you get held accountable. Because you get pushed beyond your limits. You got to do things you don't want to do. Things that you don't feel like doing, even though you know you got to do them. This is discipline. Oh, Ayla, I thought you was talking about spanking. Oh, no, 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 I ain't talking about spanking. You're talking about something else. I'm actually talking about discipline. The word for discipline means to learn and it means to train. It has nothing to do with sasa in somebody. So let me put this another way. If we ain't training our kids, we ain't disciplining our kids. So yes, we, have a, we need a context of grace, but we need discipline. It takes discipline. We need discipline, correction, and justice, all three in a context of grace. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23, all these verses just basically supporting from the Lord, have discipline, 
Be disciplined. Receive discipline. Practice discipline in your own life. In Hebrews, it talks about if, if we don't discipline, we won't share in the holiness of God. The word holy means set apart. If there's no discipline taking place in our life, then we look like the world is what the Bible is saying. We don't, we don't walk in the light and anointing and the shadow and the power of God. In Proverbs 6.23, for their command is, uh, is a lamp and their instruction a light. Their corrective discipline is the way to life. Discipline leads to life. Discipline promotes life. Training, godly training. Ephesians 6.4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat treat them. What that means is don't irritate your children. If the children heard what you said, stop. Don't give them another two hours of saying the same thing. And I'm speaking from personal experience. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. In Hebrews chapter 12, no discipline is enjoyable. Amen. It's painful while it's happening. But afterward, there's a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So we got to be trained. I'll have a little fun right here. So how many of you would... Uh, want to be a better parent or person of authority in disciplining those who are under your authority. Yeah. Then I'm going to say this. Amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. But receive the discipline I give you too. As I receive discipline from those above me. Power in the kingdom of God always flows through relationship, top down. And I understand that's not easily received by many people. Why? Because in the past, there has been abuse by authority. There has been leaders, there has been pastors, there has been fathers and mothers who have hurt many people, who have used their authority for selfish gain, and has wounded deeply people, church, and children. And oftentimes, those people who have been wounded deeply by a person of great authority, when they're not healed, they don't ever want to come back under authority. And I understand that. So though I may make light and have fun, I understand why some of the people don't want to be under authority. I understand that. But I encourage you to get healing. Because here's the truth. You have to submit to authority. And say that to your kids. Your kids got to submit to your authority. And I stand with you and affirm you for your authority. That's the only way they get trained. That's the only way we all get trained. Yesterday, I was so blessed while Tia was um, taking her commandment uh, schools test for seventh grade. And so, here... Uh, Let's 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 use this. Uh, let me use this this music stand as the door entering into the classroom, and out here is the the, the walkway, and so we get all these parents um, with their kids, and they're about to and they're taking a semicircle because the teacher comes out and he starts doing roll call, and as he's reading the names, you see a name is. 
is called out, a parent or two parents, they hug their kids, they high five their kids, they give them a short prayer or blessing, and the kids come out. And they go into the classroom. So we standing on the side too, we waiting, we stay like this, we waiting. Okay, Tia, come, let's go. Tia, go have some fun, go do well, we bless you. So as she's walking in, me and AJ is walking to, because um, I got to go take him to his hoike. So we walk, we pass the room like this. And then AJ looks and he says, oh, dad, bad sign. I said, what do you mean bad sign? He goes, Tia, she sat in the back of the row at the corner seat. And as we was walking, she's telling me this. I go, what? I go, and me and him at the same time, he goes, oh, that's not good. She got to go to the front. He goes, yeah, she, she got to go to the front. And, and EJ is like so supportive of his sister. He's like, she got to go to the front. She got to show the teacher that she's here to play. Like she like passes this. She want to come to this school. like, oh, take it easy. Right on. That's awesome. So we're walking because as a former back row corner student, I know the difference, okay? <laughs> I know the difference sitting in the back to sitting in the front. I can testify with my grades the difference. There is a before and after, the back and the front. Trust me. Um, so we walk in, at this point, we're at the grass. And I go, hey, EJ, um, I look back. We're kind of always distant. I go, EJ, are you willing to go and tell Tia that uh, everything we're talking about, he, he, he leaves me, he runs to the classroom, and he's like this. He's, he's doing all kinds of sign language. He's dancing, getting Tia's attention, like, move, move. He's doing that while the teacher is actually calling out names. And parents are letting their kids go. Like, complete inconsideration of everything. But EJ didn't care. He wanted to help his sister. I'm on the field. I'm watching this unfold. He gets back. I say, EJ, I'm so proud of you. I'm so blessed to see you support your sister. I'm so blessed to see you want, wanting your sister succeed, to succeed. And he said, Dad, I want her to succeed. EJ wouldn't have done that a year ago. EJ would have walked by and said, oh, she ain't going to pass. Just keep walking. <laughs> the things that he used to do to Tia used to <laughs> get Becca and I so unnerved because he was so harsh and so mean and so unloving and dishonoring of her. And I'm not saying Tia an angel, but I could see the difference from EJ being trained. I can see the difference of EJ being disciplined. See, what happened is that from, we walked from, if you know uh, the campus, from where we're at in Konea, all the way down to, the, to uh, Keiko Gym. It's a long way down, and it's even a long way back up. That whole time, me and him just connecting as a father and son about what just took place. See, if you're using discipline, in your view, and your understanding of discipline, and if this you and your child, and it's doing this, the more you discipline, you're not disciplining them. Where they eventually end up like this, crushed, and they do this, they turn away from you, they want nothing like that. That's not discipline. God's design of discipline is always do this. To the point where you, you like this with your kids. Even through, and especially, and because of difficult times. Let's stand and close in prayer. Father, I know we, we're not done with the message. So much more uh, to share uh, in the coming weeks. But Lord, with what, ha what you have sown to us right now, I ask that you would impart it, Lord. I pray that each and every one of us, through the teaching and counsel and guidance of the Holy Spirit, would do an inspection in our lives right now. 
whether it's fear of submitting to authority, whether it's letting go of things that mom and dad would pass down to us, and we're having a hard time letting go because it doesn't fit in your word, it doesn't support your word. Or it's simply just not understanding how much you want to use our own families for your purposes. Beginning this Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And so, Lord, I ask that you'd give each, you would bring deliverance, Holy Spirit, you'd bring counsel, you'd bring affirmation and teaching along with your word. But, Lord, I also ask that you'd give us vision right now for what you want to do in our families this Thanksgiving. Setting the tone for the rest of the holidays that eventually becomes an everyday experience for our families. There's so many other families, Lord, not in the kingdom, that actually hungering and thirsting and wanting their family to be one. And these families may never actually enter into the door through the doors of a church. But these are families we know. These are people that we know. So a day will come after we've been trained, discipled, healed up, that you can call us to do barbecues with these guys, to go to games with these guys, to hang out with these families. And then next thing you know, they want to be in the kingdom. And you have so much more for us so Holy Spirit, I ask that you continue to lead, guide, counsel all of us, Lord. Becca and I and our family as well. We just bless every single person here. We bless every single family, Lord. We thank you for such a gracious, it, you're, you're a God of discipline. You don't fool around when it comes to training. But you're founded in love and grace and that's all. All of the above. We thank you, Lord. We bless you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all be blessed. Happy Thanksgiving. Have a blessed, blessed weekend.